Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar about the NERC Digital Solutions Hub. Um, my name is Richard Kingston, I'm Professor of Urban Planning and Geographic Information Science here at the University of Manchester. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is uh, this NERC Digital Solutions Programme. It's a five year, eight million pound investment um, to build what UKRI, UK Research and Innovation call a national facility. Um, so this Digital Solutions Hub is in, in phase one at the moment. Um, it's funded by NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council, and it's supported by NERC's five data centres across the bottom of the screen there. Um, if you go um, search for the uh, NERC Environmental Data Service, you'll be able to then access data from these five data centres. Now, one of the interesting things about what this programme is doing is our core focus is to work closely with stakeholders outside of academia, so across the public, private and third sector. Um, we also think that there's a lot of uh, academics and researchers uh, that are not in kind of environmental science and climate science who are kind of NERC's core um, sort of users really that would benefit from what we are doing. Um, so partly this is all about the fact that these five data centres across the five of them, they, they sort of curate over 40 petabytes of environmental data. This data is mainly used by kind of climate scientists, environmental scientists, physical geographers, um, but there's real value in this to, to others outside of uh, those kind of domains, particularly when we look at think of organisations within government, whether that's national, regional, local, but also environmental sector, whether that's in industry or third sector. Um, so there's huge potential. Um, so the main primary sort of aim of what we're doing here is to make better use of this data that sits in these five data centres. Now, when we proposed what we were going to do to NERC, um, we said, well, whilst this data is a great resource across those five data centres, actually where you really get benefit from this data is when you combine that with a whole range of other social, economic, health and other environmental data. Um, and what we're doing at the moment is just focusing on the on the UK. And that's the whole of the UK. All four nations from a national level down to country level, down to regional, local authority level, and, and much lower down to neighbourhood scales, depending on who, who, who the users of this uh, hub may be. Um, obviously, some of the data that NERC hold goes outside of the UK. It's global. Things like British Antarctic Survey, a lot of uh, their data holdings cover, well, not surprisingly, Antarctica but also Himalayas and a lot of things around sort of Greenland and um, the Arctic around uh, ice melting and things like that. Um, the other important thing about what we're doing um, is this isn't just some sort of huge uh, data portal. It's not just a place where you will go and uh, find, you know, catalogs of data. Um, this, this blue image in the top right hand corner, that's uh, NERC supercomputer called Jasmine. So the hub will sit on top of Jasmine and what that allows is something quite unique that a, a lot of our potential users haven't had before and that's high performance computing to do analytics and modeling on this data. We currently run until 2025 and then the idea is hopefully if we do this correctly that we will then get additional funding for another five years to keep this, this facility um, running. Um, so one of the reasons why uh, we were awarded this, I don't know if any, it's quite an old film now, but if you've ever seen the Kevin Costner film, Fields of Dreams, and they talk about this idea of if you build it, they will come. Uh, well, we're, we're not doing that. Uh, our overall approach around if we built it, i.e. we built some kind of digital solution, this digital solutions hub, and then we go out there to the community and say, look, this, we built this great thing, you should really do it. Well, no, 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 that is not the way you do this. Um, we could have spent four years building this out of five years and in the final year go out to all of these users and say look at this great thing it can do a b and c um, but what users then end up telling us we know this from previous work is well great it can do a b and c but we also wanted to do x y and z and at that point you run out of money and you can't respond to that requirement so we, we've we've shifted our approach and decided that you need to put users at the front and center of this um, so we spent a large part of going back into when we were all in lockdown, a lot of uh, my time was spent talking to all of these organisations. These are sort of the big players at the national level across the UK. 
but also lots of other smaller organisations, particularly local authorities and smaller environmental consultancies, the kind of organisations that could really benefit with using NERP's data and integrating it in with their own data. Um, so lots of conversations with lots of organisations, but it's a funding that we've got. So as I said earlier, rather than building something first and then going out to, to potential users and saying, look at this great thing, we, we turned it the other way around and said, well, actually, we'll first of all, start off with some context scoping, map the landscape of, of stakeholders, understand, and that was, again, some of those initial conversations during lockdown, understand what, uh, what some of those users want. And then we had a really uh, kind of intensive phase from September 2023, uh, 2022, sorry, through to February 2023, where we went around the whole of the UK doing face-to-face -face workshops. Um, so we targeted very particular organisations that were open to it for anyone to come. And I'll say a little bit more shortly about the kind of people that came along. So we did all of that work last winter. Then through, uh, through March to, to July, all of the knowledge and information that was generated from those user workshops around the UK that was all analysed and brought together and we developed what are called user personas and uh, identified different different scenarios of what data users want to do with this data. Um, that report is available through our website and uh, there's a link at the bottom corner of the screen there. Um, and now what we're doing is going back to those users, the ones who ticked a box on their paperwork saying they were happy for us to follow up with them. And we're actually digging much deeper into their requirements. So we're doing um, two of my, my colleagues, two of my postdocs are doing one-to-one uh, -one interviews. They're starting in, in the next few weeks. They're happening between now and, and middle of December, uh, where we really dig down into, well, you, you told us this, what do you actually mean by that? What exactly do you want this hub to do uh, within uh, the context of what you're doing? In parallel to that, we've obviously got a lot of software development ongoing. Uh, we're testing and trialing different approaches um, with 40 potentially up to 40 petabytes of, of data available to users. Uh, we can't second guess exactly what data sets users are going to be wanting to use, but that creates um, a, a few challenging issues about how you uh, ingest that data, how you uh, extract it, transform it, how do you load it into this hub. Uh, at a time when NERC are also thinking about net zero and not wanting to shift vast amounts of data from a data store into, a, into some other environment. Um, and then the idea is from the second half of next year, again, my, my uh, little face in the corner is covering this up, but the second half of 2024, we'll go out doing user acceptance testing with those users from the workshops. And then we'll move on to um, doing, um, you know, rolling that out to a much wider uh, broad of users during 2025. So, this is some of the headline sort of outputs from what users told us uh, and, and some of the problems they face uh, that they, they really struggle with the fact that data is held in lots of disparate places, whether that's within their own organisation or lots of other organisations, national government, things like data.gov.uk. Um, data also is not held in formats or in systems that are, make it easy to search and find. Um, often, um, you know, if you, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, it's difficult to find relevant data. Um, it's not always obvious what the purpose of different platform a different platform is and the variety of data that they con contain. So over the last decade or so, there's been a, uh, a pretty big growth in, in the number of kind of data platforms, not just you know at national level in this country, but other countries. And, uh, um, and for a lot of the users we spoke to, they just said they were felt inundated with, with so much data they didn't really know where to start. Uh, so it's hard to keep up with the sheer range of different portals, different hubs, different um, <clears throat> places where they could go to find to find data. They also found some of these platforms were rather clunky, uh, difficult to learn, difficult to use. It would take them uh, multiple clicks to get to actually the point where the, to the data that they wanted. Um, and they just found it uh, a rather sort of arduous and cumbersome registration process um, and often found things where, and we find this with uh, some of the tools we developed, sometimes I'll get emails from people in, in local government saying they can't access um, the tools outside of their organisation because of uh, the uh, firewall restrictions and things. So a lot of practical problems that we've not really thought about that they were raising in uh, 
through these uh, through these workshops. In terms of some of the kind of headline key requirements that they were asking for, um, well, users want sufficient access to the data to be able to quality assure it uh, and and make sure you know that they can clean it and transform it into uh, suitable formats for their particular use. So, what this sort of comes down to is what they don't want is to to not be able to first bit, well, yeah, preview the data really to get an idea of what that data is, what's the metadata, where has it come from, what's its provenance, um, you know, is it, is it really, they don't want to have to have gone through lots of, uh, spent a lot of time getting this data, then doing things with it to, to actually then realise it's not quite the data set that they want, want it. So certainly reviewing a sample of the data to help them determine whether or not it's suitable uh, in a far easier way than it, than is possible at the moment. Normally you'd have to download or access a full data set or they may want to preview a, a, a subset of that to get a feel for it and understand if that's useful to their needs. Um, they also want to be able to track, uh, keep track of the work and the resources that they've used and what, what sort of processes they've applied to the to data sets. So the idea there is that the hub will, when you log in, you would have your own workspace on there and it would be able to keep track of your workflows and what you had done, had done previously. Um, so when you go back in, it's not completely forgotten uh, about about where you were. Um, they're also keen to avoid what they refer to as duplication of effort, <coughs> excuse me, through sharing of work that they've done on data sets and accessing the work others have done. So this, this has, there was lots of discussion around this. So the idea that if you are working, say for example, one, one example is that yeah, if, you, if you're in the southwest of England and you're doing some, some work, you work in a local authority, they were quite interested to know whether or not someone else in another part of the UK had been doing similar work and was there a way of sharing that and some kind of way of having a peer-to-peer -peer learning system built into the hub, uh, which was again something quite interesting that we'd not, not really thought about. Um, they also wanted to, do, to know, you know what, what were the most suitable uh, ways of applying suitable ana analysis software to data. So what was the best toolkit you know, should it be spatial analysis software? Should it be something that's going to allow them to do, um, you know, coding? Do they want Jupyter notebooks and things? So what's the what's the most suitable software uh, that they should be using for, for the kind of analysis they want to do? Um, and, and again, building on previous work done here at the university, something called MethodBox, where uh, that was developed in computer science, where you can you can put in what your criteria are, and it will tell you what the most suitable method that you should apply to that data. Um, another key requirement as well was allowing users to combine and link their own data with other data um, as part of, of the analysis. So an area where they can upload their own local data that they don't want to share and, and, and allow others to see. So what we've done with that, and we worked with Open Data Manchester, who run the workshops with us, um, we developed this idea of a user journey. And all of our users, there were over 100 uh, people turned up to the workshops from different types of organizations. We could put them into into this kind of user journey um, and an area where we, we would, you know, some users would be there to define a problem. Others and, and some some users went through this whole journey, but others would only be part of this. So some users might just be defining a problem. Uh, and then that gets passed on to another part of the team who are getting data and then analyzing that and others who might take that analysis and then somehow showcase it. Um, and then publish it. So one example of that was a couple of people who worked in the southwest of England in a local authority. They were responsible for kind of telling stories with data um, to to convince the public why a decision had been made. Uh, been made, and they were using some one way we can do that is through something called story maps, where you're integrating uh, analytics with, within a within GIS and within mapping tools, but you're you're also telling a story around that to to help you help support a particular decision that has been taken. So we, one of the things we definitely know we're going to be doing is integrating the, the what's called story maps from Esri, uh, the GIS software company, on the hub. So because this came out a lot around the country, right? People want to kind of visualise the data in a way that is is useful to a much wider audience. We were also able to put um, our users in, in, into what we call uh, personas or archetypes. So all users we, we class either an analyst, an a, the analyst, the author, the leader, the investigator, the specialist, and the data steward. Um, 
and again we, we've got a, a, a report that you can access through our website that digs you know about 80 pages long that if you're really interested in this that digs down into what all of this means we also put all of this data so we've got this isn't publicly available but we've got a rich uh, data source so all of the users um, were put into you know, we, they're all anonymized but we know the different types of organizations they came from um, what uh, data they used, which departments they were using data from. And we, this is an interactive tool that we can use to really understand uh, how users are using data and, and what they're using it for. Um, so yeah, it's an interactive data set uh, with over 100 users from 84 different organizations. These are, these are people that came to our, our workshops. Um, a really important thing that we are doing is uh, following what are called FAIR principles, so making sure that the data is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And uh, I don't know if copies of these slides will be made available, but each one of these is, is hyperlinked here, so you can dig a much deeper and find out a lot more about um, um, the FAIR principles. But without this, um, the hub will, just will not work. You've got to make the data uh, findable and accessible in the first place. Uh, so that users could know, you know, if you don't quite know what you're looking for, or you still going to be able to find things. Um, so a good example of this, so the NERC have what's called the data catalog service. And if you type something into that search, so here we've got, you know, where will be either, where will the hottest place in the UK be in 2030? It gives absolutely no results. That's because, you know, it was not designed to answer this kind of question. What you'd had to put in here is, um, uh, UK CP data 2018, that's the UK climate change program data for 2018, it would then probably give you a, a list uh, of data uh, around UK CP 18. So what we have done is taken a different approach and using a large language model, we've trained that large language model, it's Google's BERT model, on all of NERC's metadata records, that's for those 40 petabytes of data. So in our approach to this, when you say, where will be the hottest place in the UK in 2030? It doesn't give you the answer, but what it does at the moment do is give you a list of data sets that will help you answer that question. They're obviously working, you know, the next steps around this would be to actually then allow you to click on one of these links and it give you a, a preview of that data and then make the decision as to whether or not you want to bring that data into the hub for you to do some analysis. So I guess an important thing here is to say that this is not just a data portal. Uh, as I said earlier, it will, will run on Jasmine's supercomputer. And um, the fact that the vast majority of this uh, data is spatial means it lends itself to some kind of GIS approach to this. Um, and also we're obviously integrating this not just with the NERC data, but the other environmental, social, economic and health data um, and allow users under that those FAIR principles to kind of find and explore data. So this we're building on things we've done before. This is an example of work uh, myself and a colleague Sarah Lindley developed. Uh, we've been doing this for about 10 years now and we're rebuilding this using UK CP18 data and that will be relaunched. It'll look very different to this but will be relaunched um, early next year uh, with updated climate change projections. So we're building on things and testing things and trialing things and basically developing a series of what we call a set of proof of concepts. So this is to allow users to test different data types and formats, test out uh, different types of functionality and meet some of the user requirements. Um, and we're doing this through four broad use cases, one around air pollution and health, one around our housing and environmental constraints, another one around flooding and particularly flooding in coastal communities, bringing in uh, tidal surge and sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And then another use case around heat stress. And each one of these, it brings in a range of different data types. It integrates the different data centers, uh, but also having spoken to a lot of these big national organizations and, and government departments, we know that these are things that they are interested in. So it allows us for the software engineers to build something and try things out, but also produce kind of um, uh, data products and tools that we know some users uh, and find really useful, but that's not everything. There will be, you know, this also has to be quite a general system as well. So using maybe the same methods and tooling and analytical approaches, but you could be, you know, you could slot in another use case there, depending on your what what your job role is and what, and what you're trying to do with 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 data going to that today. Um, 
So if there are further details, you can get the report from the user engagement workshops is now available on our website. Um, there's an online webinar with Open Data Manchester on the 20th of November. You can find out more about that if you sign up to our newsletter. Um, that will be a two hour online event and we'll talk in a lot more depth about um, our user engagement process. So yeah, more on the website. Um, so thank you for listening. <laughs>